Hi everyone. Today we'll be talking about sight reading on mallet instruments. So when I was student teaching, I was talking to students about their preparations for regionals. They need to be practicing sight reading every day, so I shared with them that sight reading was my favorite part of practicing, because it is. Jaws dropped. Even my cooperating teacher thought I was kind of a freak. But sight reading really is a joyous thing, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have the tools to bring the full joy of sight reading into your life. So why do we sight read? Most of you know the answer, but it bears repeating. We sight read to practice reading. We want to be able to learn music faster and sight read on a gig if needed. And my personal favorite part about sight reading is that you get to hear a brand new piece of beautiful music every day coming from your very own hands. Sight reading is a broad skill set that has some similarities between instrument families, but other issues that are unique to mallet percussion. There are various perspectives to consider, but today I'm going to cover traits of good sight reading practice, traits of good sight reading materials, and how to improve ourselves and our students. Most of the information in this presentation comes from personal experiences, conversations with professors, and Dr. Ming Hui Kuo's project from when she was completing her DMA at University of Kentucky. I'll link to her project in the description. In good sight reading practice, there are two pieces of advice that ring true across every instrument. Choose a tempo where you can get almost everything right and don't stop. If you choose a tempo that's too slow, you won't challenge yourself and you may lose the feel of the piece. But if you choose a tempo that's too fast, you are setting yourself or your student up for failure. For those of you who have taken educational psychology, you may recognize the term zone of proximal development. That's where you have to put yourself. It's the individual level of difficulty that will promote the most growth in your practice. When I went to Zeltzman Marimba Festival, I went to Jack Van Geem's masterclass. In that class, Jack talked about not allowing yourself to stop in the middle of a section while practicing. When you repeatedly stop in the same spot, you train your brain to continue stopping there, even in performance. This holds true for reading, whether you're trying to learn the piece or you'll never play it again after you read it. If you train yourself to read without stopping now, it'll pay dividends when you need to read an ensemble or learn music quickly. How can we train ourselves to not stop? There are two main methods, using a metronome and reading with a buddy. Any number of people playing without a metronome are susceptible to changing tempo to some degree, so it is worth it to read with a metronome at some point. Gip Howarth would say that if you sight read at all without using a metronome, then you're wasting your time, but I think there's a little wiggle room there. However, reading alongside real people keeps you honest in a way that a metronome can't. If you fall behind a beat with a metronome, you can brush it off. But if you're offset a beat from your buddy, you are forced to adjust. If you combine this with the tenet of playing without stopping, you are challenging your skills with a scenario that approaches a real rehearsal, which will, of course, make you a better ensemble member. Should you attend to all musical markings while sight reading? Most sources, like our friend Gordon Stout, say yes. The benefits to this are apparent. In high-level ensemble music making, we want to approximate the finished product as soon as possible, and attending to every dynamic and articulation on a read-through flexes those muscles. You may have younger students take a different approach, however. Depending on the needs of their musicking, they may find more success adding in the dynamics and articulations later. This advice applies to phrasing as well. You should learn to phrase in your first reading, but consider whether your student is developmentally ready to do the same. An important reading skill to cultivate is always looking ahead. You don't need to look at the note you are currently playing, so you must be looking ahead to prepare for any challenges. Many teachers will use a piece of paper to continually cover up the note that their student is currently playing, so they are forced to look ahead. You could have a friend do the same for you if this skill gives you trouble. Our next topic is sight reading material. As percussionists, we have a unique situation. We don't have quite the backlog of melodic literature that other instruments have, but we have the range and logistical ability to play music written for essentially any melodic instrument. Most commonly, we play from concert pitch canons. Flute, trombone, violin, and guitar are the most prominent ones. If we're sight reading alone, we can play material from transposing instruments as well, but for group reading, it's best to stick to concert pitch. Music for other instruments, whether written for pedagogical reasons or solely as art, caters to the technical challenges of its instrument. This can be an asset or a hindrance for us. Take, for example, string crossings in violin music. 
An interval that only takes lifting a finger or shifting over one string for a violinist could be an awkward leap for a marimbist, but a chord that causes a violinist's left hand to contort in a heinous way could fit comfortably in a marimbist's hands. For more experienced players, this can be a fulfilling exercise in adaptability. For younger students, however, this can create confusion as their reading deviates from their path of technical development. As their teacher, you need to decide what sight reading examples your students should steer clear of, which they should be reading from, and which you decide to edit before handing to them. For example, you could give them a violin part that has open string double stops, because that's a great way to practice intervals, but decide to take out a voice where there are non-open double stops because it deviates from the day's learning objective, or take out the bowing markings and fingerings to prevent confusing your student. It's possible to avoid the complications of reading other instruments by either reading percussion literature or writing your own sight reading examples for your student. There are, as with seemingly everything in this topic, pros and cons to both methods. Reading percussion literature is a good thing for every percussionist to do. Learning more about the styles and sounds that are out there can give us a better understanding of history and trends in our instruments community. Reading from a larger work can also bring satisfaction that you just can't get from shorter pieces. However, lots of solo works are not suitable for sight reading. A couple of common examples in our literature, if there are significantly varied note durations, such as a mixture of 16th notes and half notes, it'll be difficult to play without rushing through the long notes or slowing down the quick notes. If there are complicated polyrhythms or metric changes for which one would typically have to sit down and math it out, it is unlikely that a player would be able to effectively sight read it. Writing your own sight reading examples for your students or colleagues is beneficial for everybody involved. Not only does the recipient receive sight reading material perfectly adjusted to their skill level, but you practice composing short pieces with a technical goal, most likely in a short amount of time. But therein lies the big challenge with this, time. I wrote individualized sight reading and etudes for my students during, during junior student teaching, and it worked great, but I only had three of them. If you have a studio of 20 school-age students, you'll have a much harder time writing exercises for all of them. Granted, you can build up a collection of technique-driven sight reading examples and give them to students based on their development. Sharing examples with each other and reusing the examples makes this an attainable goal. Whether you're selecting or composing material, there are a few main factors of difficulty that you need to keep in mind, some of which have already been mentioned. These are sense of tonality. Is it strong or weak? We encounter tonal language far earlier in life than any atonal language, so we will be able to better predict and audiate music with a strong sense of tonality. Kind of in a subcategory of this is use of scalar and chordal patterns. These are also based in the fundamentals of our tonal oral skills and our first few years of playing. Also limitations of range and dexterity. A wider range means that the hands and possibly the feet will travel farther, demanding better idiokinetic sense and proprioception. For formal playing, proficiency in techniques such as lateral strokes and navigating certain intervals must be considered. Presence of different clefts and ledger line notes must be taken into account as well. Differing note values. Having fewer differing rhythmic values makes for easier reading. Like alternating whole notes and sixteenth notes is harder to read than just straight eighth notes. And finally, computer printed versus handwritten. Handwritten music is significantly harder to sight read since we are usually reading from music created in notation software in our ensembles. Learning to read handwritten music can be helpful, especially for collaborating with composers, but it's easy to get frustrated reading handwritten pieces unless you are intending to develop that skill. Picking out the music and having good practice habits is most of the battle, but there are some more general changes in skills that will improve our sight reading as well. First is our field of vision habits. To effectively sight read, we need to train ourselves to not constantly look between the music and the instrument. The first step is to place our stand in a way that allows us to see where the groupings of accidental notes are in our peripheral vision. As advanced players, once our idiokinetic sense is developed enough, we should be able to play a piece without seeing the instrument at all, adjusting our positioning through what we hear and feel. Try playing a piece you know well while staring to the side or up at the ceiling, or have a friend hold a piece of cardboard between your eyes and the keys. Next up is aural skills, the aforementioned what we hear. This has two benefits, audiation and familiarity with tonal language. 
If you are able to audiate the piece you are reading, you will know when you play a wrong note and what the right note should be. This informs how you adjust your hands to hit the correct notes without looking. Familiarity with tonal language, as mentioned before, allows you to see patterns in order to predict what comes next. This will, of course, increase your accuracy, and it will also increase your awareness of the phrase to improve your phrasing. To improve the skill, you need to invest time in sight singing lots of tonal music. Music school students already have a strong foundation in this from their aural skills classes, but be sure to keep it up once those classes are through. Along the vein of pattern recognition, you and your students need to train your facility with scalar and chordal patterns. These show up plenty in our repertoire, and if you catch them, it can turn a particularly noty passage into a no-brainer. I'm sure you've heard this before, but incorporate intervals, scales, and chord progressions into your warm-ups. If you keep these patterns in your hands, you'll definitely notice an improvement in your note accuracy across the board. Verbally naming scales and chords on site in your music can also reinforce this skill. A final skill that is important for musicians of all disciplines and skill levels is scanning the piece for information. The detail with which you scan will depend on how much time you have. For NISMA, the students have one minute to look for the piece and are told the key signature and time signature. In a college lesson, your professor may just give you 10 seconds. There is no set order for a priority of pertinent information, but a rough order of events could be key signature, time signature, roadmap, technically challenging spots, phrase structure, and then anything else you have time for. So that just about does it for this presentation. Today, we've discussed the qualities of effective sight reading practice, finding appropriate sight reading materials, and how to set ourselves and our students up for success outside of the act of sight reading. For further learning, you could check out Dr. Meng Hui Kuo's DMA project, Gordon Stout's book, Idiokinetics, David Hickman's Music Speed Reading, or Gif Howarth's Sight Reading Handout. Some sight reading materials I use on the regular are Rubank Duet Books, Bartok's 44 Violin Duets, and any classical guitar book I can get my hands on. I know lots of you are more advanced players who are already pretty familiar with the concepts behind sight reading, but I hope you've gotten some new ideas that will aid you in your practice and teaching. And I hope that if you weren't in love with sight reading before, you end up liking it just a little bit more. Thanks for watching.